We are ready to go. We are here live today in the third week of our eight-part series that is talking about all of the things about parents at work and working parents. I am joined today by my lovely and intelligent friend, Elizabeth Rodriguez Dennehy. We are joining you from opposite ends of the state where it is rainy and cold in both places, but we are going to heat things up today by having very open discussion, very frank discussion, and we are definitely going to be calling some things to the table that you want to hear and talk about. So in our first week, we talked about mommy guilt and how mommy guilt really affects women and other men in the workplace. Last week, we talked about parenting at work and what things are different with parents. And today, I'm really excited to talk about people that we don't usually talk about when we're discussing working parents, and that is the single professional, so people who are not parents people who are maybe being asked the question, people who feel that unconscious pressure of, but are you gonna have kids now that you're married? Or how is this gonna affect your career? And Elizabeth is prepared to talk to you today about some things that I think are gonna knock your socks off. <laughs> oh, so I'm very happy to be here again with you. And yes, we have to, we have to start with the, the individual who I've always felt has been overlooked in many ways and overworked in so many ways. And I remember when I was starting to do the research for my book, and that was back in 2008, and my book was published in 2012, and here we are in 2018. And back then, um, one of the things that I wanted to impress uh, with the people reading the book was this whole idea of women taking on the power, the good power of carving their future. When we started to uh, understand how we could control pregnancy, so birth control, um, a new world started. And a world that included women who for the first time realized they could think of being professionals with passion and gusto just like anybody else. Um, in the research I did, what I kept finding was the fact that women were feeling even more pushed to make a, a, a huge transcendental decision. Do I have a family or do I have a profession? And many because now they felt they had control over their, their destiny, meaning I don't have to be a mother uh, by chance. I can make a choice or choose not to be a mom. Um, started to say, I don't want to have a child. I want to stay single. I want to dedicate my life and my aspirations to my profession and other things in the community. Oh boy, but making that decision has really consistently produced unintended consequences. Shannon, let's share some of those consequences with our viewers before we start with what are we going to do about this? So, go ahead. Definitely. Yeah, and I think, uh, Elizabeth, when you told me you wanted to talk about birth control today, I thought, wow, now this is a powerful thing to talk about when we look at generations previous. And we're really only going back really two generations of working women. They didn't necessarily have the choice to say, I want to build my career. I'm going to defer motherhood so that I can get to a place where I want to professionally. And then I'm going to decide if there is a right time to have a baby, when is the right time to have a baby? And the ability to make that choice has really impacted the way that we integrate our professional and personal careers. And I can remember my husband's booby told me a story. She was working and, um, you know, two generations ago, this was, this was pretty powerful for her to be a woman at work. But when she was pregnant and she told her boss she was pregnant, her boss said, you better hide that. You better hide that. Oh hide the fact that you're pregnant. Hide. And now we get. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hide hide that. Right. Can you imagine this? So, so here she is, a professional woman working, and, and her boss is telling her, don't let anybody else know you're pregnant. And, and now we have the ability to use 
you know, pharmaceuticals, science to say, I'm going to defer this until I feel like it's time for me to become a parent. If you choose to, um, here's what we want to discuss and we want to uh, open the dialogue and uh, we're going to give you recommendations because this is a very sensitive issue when you bring it to work. So we want to work with you on that. But um, I have three very close friends. One is of Jewish descent, another one is African American, and another one is Italian. Very different women, very different cultures. Neither of the three of them wanted to have children. Professionally, all of them decided no. And it, it was they were trailblazers because they're my age. So back then, um, and it was interesting to listen, and he is still now, the stories behind how much people spent time trying to figure out why. Uh, why are you not going to be a mom? And here's an answer that I want us, this is a little bit ahead of time, but this is important. They knew, as some of you know now, that parenting requires a lot of skills, time, commitment. And you know, the most powerful thing I feel people bring to life is honesty, authenticity. Can I? And there's nothing wrong with saying to yourself, you know what? This is a big responsibility. I don't know if I have what it takes. I do know I have what it takes about being the engineer, about being a good daughter, a good niece, a good friend. But parenting is not for me. And this is where we want to start to plant a seed with you. Does that make sense, Shannon? I think it makes perfect sense. And some of the things that, that single and non-parent professionals are definitely considering is, what is the perception of me by this hiring manager, or by my promoting manager, or by an executive who may say, here now is a woman of childbearing age Here's a woman maybe who just got married. Here's a woman that I'm interviewing. Should I put her on this big project? Should I give her a promotion? Because I assume pretty soon she's going to have a child. And, and so these assumptions are what we have been discussing so far. In the context of the single woman, the words that come up or the associations are she's too ambitious. She might be just thinking of herself. Um, she might not be a team player because look at her, she's, she's sort of like looking and thinking of herself. All the different connotations that come out of that place of, of being, people being challenged by a paradigm that does not fit their mold. And this unfortunately doesn't only happen with men as they look at women. Women do the same thing to other women. So when are you going to have a baby? Or you know, I, I know a lot of young professional women who is, they're surrounded by all mothers, professional mothers now, and, he, and she or they, maybe a couple of them, are the only ones who do not have children. And they say, you know, sometimes even going to a social event is not that fun anymore because it falls into that place of when is it that you're going to join this club? And what if the answer is, I'm not joining that club, but I want to still befriend all of you as a friend and as a professional. And so there are many anecdotes that Shannon and I looked at in terms of scenarios that sort of uh, help um, us frame this conversation for you and bring up a couple of, uh, a series of recommendations. Um, I want you to know that the perception of of being single and ambitious is something that is manageable. Um, also, I want you to know that it's something that happens across cultures um, with exceptions and we'll clarify. In other words, in Latin America, the same thing will surface. In some parts of countries in Europe, the same thing will, will surface. It's starting to, uh, the tone to go down because of the financial issues. The economies have been so affected by so many things in so many parts of the world that women and men, but particularly women are saying, 
after investing $100,000, $200,000 in my education, four or five years of my time, this needs to pay off. Besides, I need to pay the bills. So it's almost like we've pushed women to that corner because the circumstances in front of them do not allow for a lot of flexibility. And then we're gonna talk more in another um, of our modules about what are the things that could be collectively part of our conversation. Okay. But Shannon, um, when you're in the work environment with other professional women, have you been part of this interchange in which single women feel maybe not threatened, but uncomfortable? with this type of scenario? Definitely. I think it, it ranges all the way from the water cooler conversation when people are talking about the challenges of daycare or who takes care of the child when there's a snow day. And then I think there's also that, that sort of feeling of superiority, like, you know, is your life really complete if you don't have a child? And, and, and how do you really fully express yourself as a woman if you're not also a mother? And I think there is some conflict there. And, and there's a lot of conversation about conflict between stay-at-home mothers and working mothers and not as much conversation between the, the differences between working mothers and working women who are not mothers and maybe never plan to be mothers. Exactly. All right, so let's talk about what can we do about this. I and mean, we want to spend time with you going through each one of them. The first thing we want to tell you is do not feel defensive. Do not get defensive. Do not put your guards up and start to shoot the moment you're told or suggestions are made about something so personal, which is it is, and so much part of your private life. We get it. It's actually it shouldn't even be a question, but it is. And we are, we are, it's always going to show up, particularly in this part of the world, because it's part of the social context. Mm -hmm. We have to remind ourselves we are raised in environments that create in our mind what we call heuristics. So those are uh, moments in which we ground our perception of things and they're automatic. So girl, nice. Boy, aggressive. Women, mother. Um, women, caretaker. And so those associations walk with all of us Monday morning to work. And so knowing that helps us understand that I cannot be, I should not be defensive. I need to take the moment for what it is and make sure that in my demeanor, my body language, in my tone of voice, I'm not feeling threatened. The moment that I show concern or anger, the person in front of you wins. The person in front of you knows that he or she is validating a perception. Whereas if you listen to the, or the question or comment and you stay calm in present moment and you say something like, I can understand why you would really assume I would want to have a child. And I, I think parenting and being a mom is a, it's an incredible responsibility. I might change my mind, but for now and for the next five, six, eight years, I don't see myself having a child, even getting married, could be. I really like what I do. I love the fact that you come to work and you're able to be happy with your kids and work. I admire that from you. I, I hope we continue to have this conversation because it, this is important. But from my end, I just, don't feel it's the right thing for me to do. And if it's conveyed with a tone of voice and a demeanor, and you circle back to them to say, I know where you're coming from diplomatically, that's very helpful. What do you think about that, Shannon? 
I think it's perfect. And, and one of the things that, you know, when you talk about heuristics, I think it's important for us to recognize that bias and recognize the fact that we do connect those things. So in our mind, we say, you know, women are mothers and women are caretakers. The, the first step is really for us to recognize it. And the second step that you brought up um, is to communicate about it. And I think that's one of the things why it's so important that you and I are helping to have this conversation with, with our audience is that people are afraid to talk about this at work. People are afraid to bring this up to their boss. And, and I think when we're discussing that messaging and how to talk about it with people they work with or how to have that conversation with their upper management, it's so important to communicate. Absolutely. And, and in the first category of don't get defensive, listen to what people say and then respond, not react. It's also, if, if it's appropriate to explain to that person, you know, I sacrificed the five, six years uh, for my education and I, I got myself a, a great education for which I maybe have to pay for now. Um, this is a very important part of my life by which I am I'm feeling the return on that investment. And for me now, that's as much as I can do and take. So don't be defensive and start thinking of what would be your sort of your, your pitch, your response in a way that is informational, it's, it's descriptive, it's not um, a short, dry, well, what is it to you <laughs> type thing, and help people understand where you're coming from. So that's one. Number two, and this is really important. You need to really look around. What is the culture of the company or group you're entering and joining? Please don't get yourself in a tunnel vision and not do due diligence. Because if the culture you're walking into and you walk around is 99% men, and most of them are in that high gear, you know, running, one up in each other. Tell me why the perception of you coming in and wanting to be a trailblazer, and by the way, I'm gonna do this by myself without any other attachments, and I don't care if this paradigm is fitting for you. You know, that type of thing, is, it's not gonna take you anywhere because you're starting from with a very weak link, and that is, the environment you're going to be surrounded is not going to be receptive to understanding your desires. And so that's very important. What do you think about that, Shannon? Well, <laughs> it's almost like you're telling my secrets. I've worked I've worked at places like this before where, you know, it's it's incredibly male dominated. There are very strong stereotypes. And, um, you know, there are expectations that come with being a woman in an organization that is very highly driven by testosterone. And I think that's, that's something, your point is very well uh, received by me, which is don't be defensive, but also be aware of the type of dragon slayer that you're entering so that you understand how you can maintain your authenticity in that type of environment. Yeah, and if it's possible, because here, Shannon has been able, and I've met her, actually I've known Sharon and I, I think we already have, getting into an, a year anniversary, I think, are we? I think so. I anyway, think so. I feel like I've known her forever. And, and in, in my observations of, of Shannon and her stories, uh, her world has been predominantly men. And yes, she manages not only to come through in a very, very, very authentic female uh, way. But, but she is a really great example of what I call an assertive woman. She knows exactly how to say the yay nay in a way that she is not making people feel uncomfortable. And if there is some comfort, that's the last resource. And that typically works really well. Um, but I want to tell you, for example, law firms. If you look around and it's a law firm in Wall Street, I need to help you, remind you, and, and again, keep you aware that the expectation 
And this is not only about whether you're gonna have a child, the expectations around you as a single professional will be, we can give her more work, she can then give more time, we can have her come on the weekends, it's all going to be unconscious. And so the question for you is, do I wanna take that job, right? So, and, and if the decision is yes, then you're walking with your eyes wide open and knowing that for now, those circumstances might be very real and will be predominant in the interactions with you. People will try to use you more and dump you with more work. It's gonna happen. Make, make sense, Chen? It makes perfect sense. Uh, as you know, I didn't have Halligan until I was 36. So I was a working professional for a long time before I became a mother. And in fact, I wasn't, I wasn't certain I was, I was destined to be a mother. But um, one of the things that you recognize is when people have specific needs for their family, you know, the child has ballet class at 530. So that mom has to leave at five o'clock and there's a proposal due the next day. Someone has to stay and do it. And a lot of times that work falls to the person who doesn't have a child, who is a single professional, who's maybe trying to carve out a name for themselves and, and is left with that dilemma. And I think this is a very real dilemma for us to talk about. Yeah. Is it okay for you to pick up the slack for somebody who maybe isn't, isn't able to do so because of their familiar obligations? And their decision to have a child. Right, because they chose to have a child. And that takes us to the third step. Um, be very clever and be aware of moments in which you can have these discussions at work. You know, someone brings up the topic, like Shannon just said, oh, I have to bring my daughter to ballet at 5.30. And maybe you were asked to cover in a previous moment. And so, you know, it's interesting. A couple of months ago, this happened. And, and now you can have this conversation. You can have it, you know, with a great tone of voice. You are in control. Your body is not showing that you're angry. You're expressing an, obs an observation that you don't want to repeat. An experience that is not acceptable. And so when you, you're alert and you're strategic about when is it that I can really bring this topic and educate people about the reality of why is it that I want to not have a child. Uh, and again, it might be I want to really be able to have time with my community. I'm very passionate about yoga. I'm very passionate about um, Zumba. I don't, and, and other family events and volunteering with my community. And I see myself, and so the other day I accepted, but this is not something that I think makes any sense for us to perpetuate. I think we all need to start to think about the fact that we all make individual choices. And once in a while, everybody can be flexible, but not the same person. Everybody can yeah. be per flexible, but not on, on behalf of the same person. The same person cannot be the one solving the problem. And so you want to be actively speaking up and using moments that call them be yes, right? To describe a scenario and say, you know what? I was a team player then. I really don't want people to think that there's an expectation behind the fact that because I don't have a child, I can be the go-to person. And look at the person in the eye and say, do you think that's fair? What do you think about that? If you were me, how would you feel? And that conversation starts to help people shift the mind. And when we teach um, how to manage unconscious bias, one of the remedies for unconscious bias is talking precisely about the issue and having interactions. That starts to reframe your heuristics. That starts to sort of inform your default thinking with new information and that's how things start to change have you ever had a chance to do that at work shannon i have i have uh, and then you know i think you've kind of already called me out for being <laughs> full of 
candor and <laughs> being very communicative. And I do think a lot of our expectations come back to saying, here are my expectations of the situation. You know, I volunteer on Wednesday nights. And while I appreciate that this person has to take their, their child to ballet class, and we have a proposal due tomorrow, I also have an obligation. Um, and, and I think there's also something to be said for turning that around to your benefit, to saying, hey, both of us had obligations tonight. I ended up pinch hitting, um, you know, I hope that you remember this when it comes to our next one-on-one -on -one or my annual review. Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And so proactively having this conversation, I want you to think what, what we're trying to tell you here is there is a solution and there is a process. It takes time and it takes rigor. So you want to be very smart every time you can in, in the way you express yourself, behave yourself, speak up so that people understand and they will eventually things start to that that there is no hidden agenda you're not trying to you know be difficult it should not be that those associations should not be there but they are and so again what we're trying to say is giving you those tools will help you navigate through now the number four recommendation is Make sure that you state your case, your vision of self during your job interview. You know, job interviews are golden moments and obviously affecting, accepting those offers, golden moments um, in which you're doing, one of the things you're doing is you're interviewing the person in front of you because if you're really conscientious about your professional life, you just don't walk in and say yes to anything. So you want to make sure that it's the right place, the right culture. And you want to make sure that there is some latitude from the person that uh, is in front of you representing the company to understand where you come from. And so these conversations can be had at the beginning with caution. Be careful because at the beginning you don't want to sound like a lot of people say these young professionals or younger people, work, they're all thinking always about themselves. And so how do I put myself in a place in which I can express where I come from and sound very professional and actually a, a part of a team, if I were to join you? Something around, you know, this position is really ideal for what I've been looking for. I can see myself not only really perform really well, hopefully, and I'm gonna to prove to you over average. And one of the reasons why I feel I can do that is because I have made a decision to pretty much concentrate on my professional growth. Now, how is it that you here in the company look at you know, a track like mine, most likely I will not be a mother. And one of the reasons that I like to bring this up to you is how is it that you protect or help single individuals from being overpowered by work from other people or perceptions that we are too ambitious or want too much for ourselves? And, I, and I'm saying this to you, this is, again, you gauge the moment. But this is about to say, and I'm saying this to you because I want you to know I want to be fully committed to the company. And I want to really understand how you see this issue so that we can be fully aligned. Does that make sense, Shannon? It makes perfect sense. And I think, you know, an employer is never, ever going to love you more than they do during the interview process. <laughs> That is when you're, you're wow. sending your representative. That is when they really are looking for you. That is when you don't have any established history with them. And it's such a good time also, not just for them to evaluate you as a candidate, but for you to evaluate them as a company and decide, 
does this culture meet what I need? And if I'm, if I'm choosing not to have children, am I going to be able to grow with this company? Or if I am choosing to have children, will I be satisfied by the ability that I have to take a path in this company? And I think the interview is the perfect time to start to lay the foundation for the type of employee you want to be and how you see yourself growing within that culture. Absolutely. And I'll give you a, a very, it's a perfect story from one of my friends. She, the woman that, that I was mentioning, African-American um, of origin, uh, she was one of the top executives at IBM. And she uh, had her career in IBM. She retired from IBM. And when she started, she, she was a very feisty, brilliant woman. She was actually in HR all of her career. And she pretty much said it. I'm not married. I'm, I'm married. I'm, I don't have children. And she said, I just, I'm not a mother type. I love work and I love travel. And so I'm fully committed to do as best I can for IBM. And she traveled the world. Uh, she was sent as an HR director to different parts of the world. Uh, she was able to put together huge um, initiatives. And she had a very, very, very um, successful career. And so what I'm saying is this can happen. Now, uh, her name was Frances, it's Frances. Um, she had also the gift of the way in which she could say things. And she could say things with a smile <laughs> that were perhaps difficult to be spoken by somebody else. She had that. And what we're trying to help you understand is a lot of these conversations about boundary, because this is what we're saying. We put a boundary. Here's where I, this is as far as I want to go. Um, need to be conveyed such that it's a collaborative environment and not a confrontational environment. And the other women in my life that I just mentioned, one owns one of the biggest companies in public relations in town. And the other one is a very, very successful uh, marketing woman all of her life. And not having children um, became, actually with time, one of the things that, that I, we can tell you is the, the conversation starts to drop, right? People just get used to the fact that this is who you are. So this leads us to the last point, which is patience. You, you want to be patient. Um, this is the reality we are in. The, this country, the USA, is the only country who still doesn't have parental leave legislation. I was just sharing with Shannon that I read this wonderful article this morning about a couple that moved from New York to Sweden. And if, as you know, if you don't, please look into it. Sweden is the most progressive country in terms of family and work. And one of the beautiful sentences he said was, I now know how it feels not to have to choose between being a professional and being a parent. I will never go back to the U.S. again. This is a great experience because I have the best of everything. And so does my wife. Both working parents to have two kids. And it's a beautiful story. And like that story, we hear a lot of that in Europe, in some parts in Europe, predominantly in the Nordic countries. But for the rest of us, we just have to be patient. We just need to move forward. Consistent, and most importantly, don't lose sight of why is it that you're doing this. You're having these conversations because you love to be a nuclear engineer. And as such, you want to be able to perhaps come up with the next great thing. And you want to have time, space to dedicate yourself to do that. And we both say, go for it. And we want to have you know that that's exactly why we're saying this to you. We're here for you because you're entitled to do just that. Um, meanwhile, um, keep going, 
be patient, play cool, do not react, and be alert. Be alert to moments in which you can teach people the who you are, where you come from, and why is it that nuclear science and nuclear engineering is so compelling to you? Does that make sense, Shannon? I think it makes perfect sense, and I think um, one of the other things I really wanted to express, because I know we have a lot of people watching that are actually managers, is, is to help to create that atmosphere where people can be uh, patient, where people can respond and communicate without feeling defensive. And I think um, for, for those of us that are managing people, it's so important to help create that atmosphere where we can really help and allow people who are deciding not to have children maintain yes. their their sense of self and not be viewed in a negative way and not be given all of the extra work and i think that is something that is really important for us to remember um, from the other side of it also i want to pretty much close mentioning and this is a piece of research that i use in the book um, it's in my book it's on page 33 um, back then, in 2008, and this was the Pew Research Center, in 1976, only 10% of women are, were childless. By 2008, it had already risen to almost 20%, and that's in 2008. And so the trend continues to climb, and again, uh, to the extent in which there are countries in which they're having no population growth. Right, so Japan is one, Spain was another one. We are about to go into that place, um, except for the fact that we've been supplemented. So kids who come from non-white, uh, particularly Hispanic uh, population and non-European. Um, but, but so what I'm, we're trying to close this with is the following. Here's a trend, here's a reality. Um, we can't feel awkward guilty about it. We need to know what is for us to move forward and professionally feel controlled and empowered. And so I hope we leave you with a set of tools that as you think them through, allow you to feel a sense of, I can handle this, I can do this, and I'm not going to derail. And so from my end and for now, I thank you for being with us. Send us your questions if you have any or comments. And um, I hope to see you next week. Shannon, what is our topic next week? Oh, man, we have got some real doozies coming up. We've got, we've got quite a few that remain. Um, I want to talk to them really quickly because next week we're going to be talking to married professionals who are non-parents. On April 18th, we're going to be talking about mothers at work, which is, should be a very That's juicy a conversation. One. That's a big one. Um, I'm excited for that one. Uh, I know a lot of people are already sending me questions for that one. Um, on April 25th, we're going to be talking about expectant mothers and first-time parents. And I can tell you, as somebody who did that at 36, we have we have some things to tell you. Yes. <laughs> We've got some things to yes. tell you, sisters. Um, and then on week seven, on May 2nd, we're going to be talking about men as parents and allies. So how men can join the conversation because we can't do this alone. You can't advocate for yourself all of the time. So we're going to be bringing up some advocacy tips and some things to think about. And I know I personally can't wait. Elizabeth Rodriguez, Dennehy, Shannon, Greg, we're both available on LinkedIn. We're available on Facebook. Send us your messages. Let us know what questions you want us to address. Elizabeth's been doing an amazing amount of research for this, and so I thank you so much for your generosity and your ability to share your spirit and yourself with all oh, of us. This is, this is what I live for. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, it's my joy. And for managers who are listening, um, you know, uh, Shannon said it, just continue to have the conversation. It, you have so much power in just setting up the right tone of the conversation. It's really, really critical. And you're going to save yourself so much time and so much conflict by just clearing the air from the very beginning. So that's our piece of advice as we close and we'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks so much.
Bye.